Fontaine is fresh and exciting, and it's easy to get carried away with the brand new thing. But before the memories of Sumeru fade, let's take a look at how the two compare. It's hard to match up an entire year's worth of content to just half of one patch. Any final verdict has to be left until the end of Fontaine's arc, but major versions tend to add a ton of new mechanics and stuff to do, so there's already enough there that we can see what direction they're taking and make some interesting comparisons. Sumeru felt like a big step up from the previous regions with a whole host of positives, but it did have its downsides. Has Fontaine managed to keep up the standard where Sumeru did well? Has it improved on the things which burned a lot of people out in Sumeru? And how does the brand new stuff which was introduced in Fontaine fit in? Remember, this is all very subjective and reasonable people may 100% disagree with my perspective on any and every part of this. I'd love to hear your take on it too. The aspects of Sumeru which stood out to me as big improvements compared to previous regions were the characters, the Archon quests, and the new exploration mechanics that made especially vertical exploration easier. Genshin's characters are often divisive, and it's natural for people to have different feelings towards each one, which are all equally valid. However, regardless of whether you like or dislike a specific character's personality, I'd argue that over time Hoyo has been getting better at showing depth and nuance to their characters. Early game characters do have interesting backgrounds, but so often they seem to be reduced to a caricature. Just look at any one of Kachin, Ganyu, Kokumi or Jin in most of their story appearances. They do have depth, but most of it is hidden away deep within their character profile. For the Sumeru cast, even when they were just showing up for a quick cameo, the characters felt much more consistent and well realized to me. This was especially apparent in how realistic their relationships with each other felt, and how vibrant their community seemed to be, even in the absence of the traveler. So far, the Fontaine characters have absolutely lived up to the bar set in Sumeru. Out of the people who played a big part so far, I particularly loved Navia. Her backstory could have easily led to her being portrayed as a generic child of a mafia boss style character, but instead, she has felt like a surprisingly normal person, trying to make the best of her life despite her traumatic past, and she has just genuinely been a joy to be around. Lini is fun, and I absolutely adored Lynette. It's great to see more nuance to people aligned with Chesnaya, and when Child showed up later in the quest, it was striking how he felt so shallow when compared to the subtlety they achieved with Linny. Though of course, it could be argued that Child was just playing it up for the crowd. Lynette was my favorite out of the two though. I loved her appearance and her personality is just fantastic. Her quiet cynicism feels very different to the typical Genshin character so far and I absolutely loved her for it. Nevelette has also been great and is clearly someone with hidden depths which we will hopefully uncover as we get to spend more time with him. As for Furina, we'll get to her in a minute. <laughs> Out of the characters who have had comparatively little screen time so far, Cloran probably stands out the most, with early signs that she'll be a great character with a lot of depth. I'm excited to see more developments in her relationship with Navia in particular. I also thought Fremine seemed adorable in our brief interaction with him, and Charlotte has been her usual bubbly self. So far, we've spent most of our time with either Navia or with Linny and Lynette, so currently Fontaine does lack that found family feel which I loved so much in Sumeru, but that aspect came into its own in the later Sumeru patches, so I'm hopeful this is something they'll aim for in Fontaine as well. The main Sumeru Archon quests felt like a big improvement compared to previous versions, and while it's very early days in the Fontaine Archon quest, so far it's been brilliant too. This part is possibly even more subjective than character preferences, but let's focus on two separate aspects core to any story, character and plot. We'll talk about setting later. When it comes to character development, what really makes a story impactful for me is significant and lasting character growth, plus ideally some similar growth or change in character relationships. Pre Sumeru, these factors existed on paper, but something about the writing made it not really feel like any change had actually happened. Sumeru did a fantastic job of fixing this, with multiple characters going through clear arcs, multiple relationships growing and changing, and everything working together towards the climax. The characters show lasting change, often for the better. Fontaine so far has already demonstrated some great character development, and has laid the groundwork for what I hope will be some stellar growth in upcoming patches. Navia's arc felt like a most complete, while leaving space for future development. Most of the others feel like they're a strong setup for future growth. 
Irina in particular I have strong feelings about. In the English voiceover she comes across as a bit of an infuriating brat, to the point where I actively dislike her so far. I've heard that the voiceover in other versions comes across a little differently, more insecure than bratty. But even in the English version, despite the brattiness, she comes across as a real and nuanced person to me. So despite my dislike for her personality, I think she's really well done. My hope for her is that we see some significant character growth. By displaying her clear character flaws at the start, we have the chance to see her learn, grow and become a better person by the end, which would be a perfect example of what I'd love to see in Genshin's stories. If they get that right, then I'll likely love her as a character in the end. The Sumeru Archon Quest's core plot also felt noticeably more impactful to me than previous versions. A large part of that is likely due to the deeper connection I felt to the characters involved, but I also felt that they did a better job of weaving multiple character stories into one cohesive narrative in the Sumeru arc than they had previously. The Fontaine Archon quests so far have been absolutely fantastic. The characters provide a solid emotional core, but the story structure this time around has been far more engaging for me. Each section is set up as a clearly defined mystery, and while there weren't any huge surprises, it kept me engaged and interested far more consistently than previous quests. I even read every word in the UI for each piece of evidence as we gathered it. Genshin players can read? Who knew? It remains to be seen whether the conclusion to the story as a whole will live up to the heights of the Sumeru one. This is a very tall order considering that Nahida's sacrifice is among my favourite moments in all storytelling, but they're off to a great start which definitely compares favourably to the early Sumeru Archon quests. And if they decide to keep using the same murder mystery format, I'm absolutely here for it. As to the new exploration mechanics, Sumeru tended to have convenient ways to get around without relying too much on stamina, despite the amount of vertical exploration involved. In previous regions this had been noticeably lacking. Monsan and Liyue are painful on this point in comparison, and while Inazuma did have the electro zip lines, they had some serious issues which made them painful to use a lot of the time. Ignoring the underwater for now, I feel that Fontaine has done a decent enough job at this for it to be given a pass. Instead of zip lines, the main mechanic here is these droplet launcher things, which tend to be available in most of the places you'd want them. Their main downside is that you cannot exit once you start one, and some of them take you really far from the starting point. While these seem to be less common than the sigils were in Sumeru, so far it hasn't felt like a problem. I think this is partly because the above water exploration is less of a focus, and partly because the places which aren't covered by the droplet launcher things tend to be the heights of the mountain peaks, and it's actually quite nice that they feel more of a challenge to scale than if we could just zoom to the top. So for me at least, Fontaine has kept up the quality when it comes to the things which Sumeru did well. What about the other side of the coin? When it comes to Sumeru's major flaws, again, there were three things that really stuck out to me. Quest restrictions, exploration blockers, and desert fatigue. By quest restrictions, I mean those times when Genshin locks you into a quest and you're unable to teleport away or exit the area until you've reached a certain point in the story. I do have mixed feelings on these and I think they have a valid place in the game. It can make the quest feel much more urgent and immediate and helps emphasize that these events are important. However, the way they're currently implemented can cause some issues, and due to the length of these quests in Sumeru, this was a big problem for me personally. The clearest example of this is actually my partner's experience with the Caribur quest. He logged in quite late one day, only 90 minutes or so before the server reset, planning to do his dailies. The game decided that it was a great time to start the quest. He tried everything to cancel it, up to and including restarting the console he was playing on and nothing worked. This might have been a bug since some people said that they were able to exit at some point. Either way, the end result was that he had no choice but to speed through the quest in order to get it over as quickly as possible, just so he could get his dailies done. As many people have pointed out, this is a very popular quest filled with very interesting lore, and due to the quest restrictions he pretty much missed all of it. So far, Fontaine seems to have avoided this problem. The Archon quests have been broken up into smaller sections with natural breaks in between, and the characters even ask at each breakpoint whether the traveller would like to come with them right then, or go prepare before events continue. This still feels like only a half solution though. Ideally these quests would not automatically trigger, and instead require you to have the quest selected in the menu before they start. More importantly, they should include a rough estimate for how long we can expect each quest to take. 
We'd then be able to completely avoid these kinds of situations and people can enjoy the game properly. In my Sumeru retrospective video, I touched on the problems I had with the exploration in the desert regions, but didn't really get into the details of what made it frustrating. When I'm in the mood to explore, the most basic gameplay loop I'm looking for is for me to see something interesting, maybe a puzzle, or a locked door, or even a particularly enticing mountain peak, which made me want to find my way to it. Once I've reached that point of interest and done anything specific I wanted to do there, there should be something else interesting nearby to start the loop again. Building on top of this loop, some of my favorite Genshin moments are the more complex layered exploration quests. In these, the first point of interest is a locked door, or an item I can't interact with yet. This tells me there should be something nearby to unlock it. I search the area, solve puzzles, find key items, and I'm eventually able to go back to the first point of interest and get a reward. Or in a lot of cases, fight a challenging battle and then get an even bigger reward. This can be multiple layers deep and is probably my favorite gameplay experience in Genshin. In the Sumeru Desert, all I found was locked doors. Whenever I tried to explore nearby in the hopes of finding a way to get past them, I just found more locked doors. Before I could even start the exploration that I actually wanted to do, I had to go find a quest and sit through literal hours of dialogue between characters I had never met before. And that only unlocked the first level of clearance. For most of the locked doors, I had to do even more quests. And don't get me wrong, when I'm in the mood, I do like world quests, especially when they're rich with nuanced characters and interesting lore. But that's a very specific mood for me. And as it turns out, requiring me to do a quest in order to unlock the exploration that I actually wanted to do tends to make me both dislike the quest and lose my enjoyment of the exploration. At its worst, this combination ends up making what is genuinely my favorite part of the game feel like just a guided tour, which completely kills any spark of adventure. Fontaine, thankfully, has not fallen into this trap so far. If you can see something, you can probably solve it then. I haven't encountered much layered exploration yet either, though there have been some satisfying puzzles in the underwater areas. The exception to the above is the occasional world quest which does involve guided, linear exploration, but Fontaine does it very well too, by only allowing access to these areas when you're starting the quest. Since most of the region is accessible right from the start, these quests actually stand out as quite memorable locations. They tend to have some breathtaking views, stunning set pieces, and chains of interesting puzzles to solve, and because they can be left until I'm in the right mindset to enjoy them, I've enjoyed them a lot. Desert fatigue pretty much sums up the other major problem people had with Sumeru. No matter how much you enjoy something, it's possible to have too much of a good thing, and for a lot of people, Sumeru added too much desert without anything else to add variety in between. This problem was certainly exacerbated by the exploration blockers issue, but desert fatigue is definitely a thing in its own right. A good comparison to this is the expansions added in Inazuma. There, each island already felt unique, and as expansions, we also got both Enkonomiya and the Chasm. This variety kept things fresh, and each new region was new and exciting. In Sumeru, while each section of the desert does have its own feel to some extent, for a lot of people they just weren't diverse enough for it to feel like they were exploring something new. Technically speaking, Fontaine did add some more desert, so I guess it's time to get our pitchforks out. For real though, after all the desert, Fontaine feels like a breath of fresh air with a varied landscape which really brings back the joy of exploration for people who struggled with the endless sands of Sumeru. And it also added something really special. So in comparison, I'd say that our brief time in Fontaine so far has shown noticeable improvements in areas Sumeru struggled while keeping up the quality in places Sumeru really shone. But naturally, that's only half the story. We can't have a new region without it bringing something completely new to the game. The most impactful addition in Fontaine is obviously the underwater areas. I was pretty nervous about this. In previous games, I have never enjoyed underwater gameplay. Most of the games I've played with underwater sections tend to make me feel sort of claustrophobic, especially since they usually include some sort of oxygen meter, which just amps up the anxiety. The controls also tend to suffer since it's often something added to the game to provide variety rather than being treated as a legitimate focus, and as a result, it's even more of a struggle to get to grips with it. Genshin's underwater areas, however, are simply divine. The 
underwater world feels clean, beautiful and peaceful. The music is just phenomenal. The sound effects are calming and the whole area is vibrant and full of life. Other games underwater sections feel to me like cave diving. Genshins feel like swimming through a shallow warm sea, exploring a tropical reef teeming with life. The character animations are fantastic, the movement feels fluid and natural and the controls are just perfect. Underwater combat looked like it might be awkward, and I thought it might feel bland in comparison to Genshin's fantastic main combat system, but I found it to be engaging and intuitive too. So far, I'd say that they've done an incredible job, and this has to be my favourite part of the game. I'll happily just swim through the reefs and shoals of fish and while away the time vibing to the music. It's just so utterly relaxing. The above ground world design is gorgeous too, with a very clear alpine inspiration which feels very unique in Genshin setting. I love all the little storybook cottages dotted in lush valleys and scaling the mountains has been great fun. And again, the music is just incredible. Fontaine City itself is modern and clean with a gorgeous fusion of art deco with Victorian era clothing and some steampunk aesthetic thrown in for good measure. It really does feel like it deserves its reputation as the centre of culture in Tevat. The sewers edged more towards a steampunky vibe, which again works great and has a unique ambiance. Combined with the art deco city above, it strongly reminds me of Arcane, which is very much a good thing. The other headline new feature is the Uja and Numa mechanics, which could become an interesting concept, but so far hasn't had a noticeable effect in combat. It'll be interesting to see how this changes with the future enemies or, and this may be a little bit out there, whether they become the groundwork for new powers that characters can wield in the future. But for now, it feels more like it's intended to be used as a mechanic for creating interesting puzzles rather than something which adds any depth or nuance to the combat system. One last thing which I really appreciated is the addition of the legendary enemies. I'd still like to be able to massively increase the difficulty of the typical battles in the overworld, but it was great to see these super powerful versions of the normal enemies just hanging out in the world. My favourite part of fighting these enemies is that it's the first time I was able to listen to the absolutely brilliant Fontaine battle music in-game without it stopping after just a few seconds. We're only two weeks in, but Fontaine is already shaping up to be an absolute blast and might even become my favourite region if Hoyo keeps this up. I'd love to hear your first impressions on Fontaine too. Has it helped you fall back in love with Genshin? Or do you already miss Sumeru and its secrets hidden in the sands? Let me know in the comments. I cannot wait to explore the Fontaine Research Institute. Its fantastical silhouette floating above the horizon makes me just need to go there. Version 4.1 cannot come soon enough for me. Until next time!